all kind of moms, right? There's all different kinds of moms. And I think sometimes on Mother's Day, we get stuck in just a traditional view of, oh, she's got a baby on her hip. But there's all kinds of moms. In fact, up here on the screen, you're going to see a, def a bunch of different types of moms that we want to honor and celebrate today. So the next slide. Okay. We want to make space in this house and honor those of you that are grieving this Mother's Day. I know some of you are spending your first Mother's Day without your own mom or without your child. And there is space for grief today. There's space to celebrate. There's space for unmet expectations. There's space for disappointment. There's space for the awkwardness. And there's space for hope today. So if you fit any of these categories, would you stand? We want to pray for you. And if someone near you is standing, would you just put a hand on them? And we're going to pray as we bless these moms of all different stages of life. Foster mothers. Those who don't have a mom. Those who have naturally given birth or spiritually giving birth. If you're just a motherly figure to somebody, Holy Spirit, we ask now that you would come and touch each woman that is standing right now. We ask that you would encounter her with your peace that surpasses all understanding. We declare that every tear that she has shed, Lord, you see it, and you will give her a harvest of joy. And so we come alongside our sisters right now, and we declare that they are loved, they are seen, that they are valuable, that they are needed, they are so loved, and we welcome them in this house. We thank you for each one of these women. We thank you for their legacy as they invest in children spiritually and naturally. We honor them. We bless them. And we say today is a day to celebrate and grieve and everything that is necessary for their sweet hearts. And you are with us. You are close to the brokenhearted. You are close to those that are confused and feel overwhelmed. And so we're crying out to you today, Father, and ask for a special anointing on every mother of this house. And we thank you that all of your promises are yes and amen. In Jesus' name, amen. We are so happy that you guys are here. Thank you, youth, for passing out the roses. We started doing that last year, and I just love a small token of appreciation just as a rose to say that we see you and we're thankful that you're here. There's one more category of women that I want to address today, and that is single moms. If you are a single mom, would you stand up? Single moms. Okay, wait, wait, wait. Hold on. We're going to do more, more than just clap as we are going to give these women some cash. So I want you to take out your wallet and give these women, whoever's near you, make sure everybody gets some cash because every mom knows you need some cash and single moms really need cash. So bless them, clap for them, tell them they're doing a great job. Let's sow into these single moms. We love you, single moms. You are not alone. You are not alone. We are for you. We see you. Right now, they're like, oh, this is so hard to receive. Receive it, girlfriend. You deserve it. You are worthy of every good gift. Receive the cash. Receive the hugs. Receive the help. You are so loved. You are so loved. You are doing a stellar job. Okay? You are doing a stellar job. There is more than enough grace for every storm that you have been through and that you're going through. There is more than enough grace. And I want today to be a stone of remembrance for you to remember that people want to support you. We want to rally around you. We want to invest with you and partner with you. You are not alone. And whatever the enemy has taken, Jesus will turn it for good. Okay? 
That's a promise that we can stand on. Because the enemy is a jerk. But he doesn't get our attention today. We're going to talk about the goodness of God. And I know for some of you single moms in this room, there is a season of disappointment right now because you didn't, didn't think you'd be here right now in this season of life. Okay? And so we want to acknowledge that there are some unmet expectations. There is grieving that happens. But I also want us to focus on that God is our ever-present help, okay? Whether you're single or not, that moms need help. I'm captain of that club, moms need help. So I, I have been speaking and doing all kinds of public stuff for probably 15 years. I absolutely love it. It's one of my favorite things to do. And I have to say, the message that I'm going to give today, I have never had so much attack leading up to it. In fact, a couple weeks ago, did anybody go to the Joanne Moody conference? Awesome. We were on our way here and some unexpected things happened and we were not able to make it to the conference and we were supposed to speak at it. And in fact, I was supposed to speak and share the message that I'm prayerfully going to deliver today, but the enemy has not made it an easy week. Anybody else? Anybody else feel like he's kind of just turning up the heat? And that's because he knows he's getting his eviction notice. So he's panicking. And when people panic, they operate in a spirit of fear, which is who the enemy is. He can't operate in any other way. He's the Lord of lies. It's all he does. He tries to scare us. Okay? But today we're calling his bluff. We're going to call a smoke bomb a smoke bomb. We're going to thank him for overplaying his hand. And we're just going to move right on with what the Lord's doing because what he's doing is perfect. So I want to share a few notes today. Uh, I want to talk to you about one of the biggest Christian buzzwords in the history of ever. Can you guess what this Christian buzzword is? It starts with an R. I'll give you a hint. Revival. Good. Okay. Raise your hand if you want to see revival in your lifetime. Amen. Amen. We should all want to see revival. I do. It's here, exactly. Revival is good. We want to see revival. But I think what I want to talk to you about today is sometimes the way the modern Christian church understands revival can lead us astray. Because sometimes we think revival is just can happen if we create the right formula, right? We get that anointed worship speak leader. And then we couple that with an amazingly gifted preacher Boom, right environment. Everyone's going to rush down to those altars. And folks, there you have it, revival. But is that revival? Because in this day and age, it's pretty easy to get thousands of people or hundreds of people to rush an altar and give their life to Jesus. And that looks really good. It feels good, right? And I have no doubt that lives are changed. But if we look at Acts chapter 2, we learn about how the church starts, okay? Acts chapter 2, verse 40, 41, Peter stands up after an incredibly supernatural event by the power of the Holy Spirit, and he preaches a sermon that leads approximately 3,000 souls to Christ. And I think most people will go, oh, that's revival right there, Acts 2, 41. But what if the real revival wasn't the altar call, but it was what happened in the following verses? That's what we're going to talk about today. So after Acts 2.41 is Acts 2.42. And this is where it says a verse that is very important not only to our church, because this is where we get Acts 2 communities from, but to our family. And we love it so much, Acts 2.42, that we printed it out and made it honey version. So instead of they broke bread together... They made tacos together. So this is a sign we have in our dining room. But let's read what Acts 2, 42 talks about. So remember, 3,000 people just came forward and gave their life to Jesus. Okay? That's awesome. I bet the paparazzi was all over that because we want to show numbers. But the problem is, is when you think numbers equal revival. So Acts 2, 42 says, And they continued, everybody say steadfastly. In the apostles' doctrine 
and fellowship, the breaking of bread and prayers. Now all who believed were together and had all things, say all things, things. in common, and sold their possessions and goods and divided them among all as anyone had had need. Has anybody heard that verse before? We've all heard it. But what if this right here is the recipe for revival? To continue steadfastly together. Because revival isn't the start of something. It's the continuation of something. It's a lifestyle. It's not just a singular decision. Because only real revival can get people to continue steadfastly in Christ. Because you can get a good worship band and a great preacher to get people to come to the altar, but how do you get them to continue steadfastly? That's what I want to figure out, and that's what I want to devote my life to. Because revival is not that shallow to just talk about numbers. Numbers are irrelevant. So rather than talking about how many people came, we want to talk about how steadfast they can continue. So my question for you today, family, is what if the greatest asset to revival isn't the preacher, but it's the families of the church? Families of the church. And on this Mother's Day, mothers are pillars in the family. And if you've been watching the news at all in the last hundred years, you would know that the enemy hates families. He's trying to divide them. He's trying to redefine them. He's trying to say it's something different or that you don't need a husband and a wife or a mother and a father. And that's just not true. So it's really important that we get our news from the Bible. Okay. So if we are truly interested in seeing revival, we must be committed to the discipleship of our families. Can I get an amen? If you agree. All right. So today I just want to talk quickly about what does family revival look like? And now I know why the enemy hated this sermon. Because this is where the power is. Healthy families will change the world. So three reasons why families are at the heart of revival. Are you ready? Okay, we're going to go through these fast, and then I have a fun surprise for you at the end. Here's why healthy families are the key ingredient to revival, is that revival cannot exist without the preaching of the gospel. So how can we preach the the word to a world if we haven't preached it in our own homes? Unfortunately, so many people have gifts that take them further further than their character. And so they get out front, they start churches, they start movements, they start successful businesses, and a lot of them have wonderful redeeming qualities. But I am so sick and tired of seeing the family life fall apart. It's heartbreaking. Heartbreaking. So Jesus talks about the importance of sharing the gospel. This is why the Great Commission is so awe-inspiring. Because Acts chapter 1 verse 8 says, You shall receive power. When the power has come upon you, then you shall go be my witnesses. Then you shall go be my witnesses to Jerusalem first. Then Judea, then Samaria. So God is a God of order. He's not a God of chaos. Amen? Does it matter when there is an order to a verse. Yes. So he's telling us right now which order to preach the gospel in. Do we go to the ends of the earth first? No. We start at home first. That's what Jerusalem represents. Preaching the gospel at home. And it starts right here with yourself. Okay? So the gospel doesn't start at the ends of the earth. I love missions. I absolutely love all these opportunities for evangelism and missions but not at the cost of tearing my life, my family apart, okay? And why is it that the term pastor's kid is a stereotype for rebellious and a godless child? Maybe that's our wake-up call. Okay, number two, revival cannot exist without prayer. And the power of our prayer lives very much depends on the health of our marriages. Oh yeah, we're going there. 
Because we can't pray ourselves into revival if we aren't praying for revival in our own hearts. And if you're married, this matters 100% in your marriage, married life. So I'm, I'm, just, I'm not making this stuff up. I'm just going to read what the Bible says. But 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 7 says, Husbands, likewise, dwell with them with understanding, giving honor to the wife as to the weaker vessel, and as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers may not be hindered. The idea of hindered prayer should scare us. Because that's a consequence that has gravity to it. That I would be praying, okay? Maybe I've even committed myself to be an intercessor prayer. And I'm praying, I'm praying, I'm praying. But how many of my prayers are being earmarked hindered in heaven because my marriage isn't right? The power of our prayer life is directly affected by what's going on in the natural in my relationships. So ask yourself this. Is there something in your prayer life right now that you are not seeing breakthrough for? Okay? Ask yourself, how's your marriage? How are you, how's your relationships closest to you? Are you bitter and angry towards your spouse? Are you flirting with somebody who's not your spouse? Are you watching pornography? Porn is the biggest intimacy killer out there right now. It does not bring connection. In fact, the opposite of an addiction to anything is connection. So I want to encourage you right now that the table is set and the invitations have been sent out that his kindness allows us to repent. That we get to repent. We get to say, Lord, I don't want any thought in my mind that you don't have in yours. And when we do that, when we align ourselves with who he says we are, then it allows an openness, an alignment for grace to flow into our marriages, not only for unity, but so that our prayers can be answered. Okay, this is how God designed it. So we must want to live in repentance for these lifestyles of anything that would threaten our marriage. And if you don't trust me, watch marriages right now in America. They're under attack. Okay, watch what's happening in the media right now. They're making it a spoof of how couples interact because they're trying to show, this is the enemy's agenda, that there's no reason to be married. And that's just not true. Marriage is so powerful, so powerful. So let's move on to the third reason why families, healthy families are the heartbeat of revival. And this is when it comes to parenting, okay? You don't have to have your own children to understand that what you do and how you spiritually parent other people matters. Has anybody, raise your hand if you have somebody in your life that has spiritually parented you that is not your blood parent, Okay, awesome. I see hands all over the room because we're saying somebody loved me enough to invest in me even though I wasn't theirs first. They chose to invest in me. And godly parenting is the heartbeat of a re revival. I'm just gonna look at two quick verses about how much God cares about children. Because our society th seems to think that they're dispensable. And that's just not true. So in Mark chapter 10, verse 14, Jesus, the goat himself says, let the little children come to me. That was not an animal reference. It was a greatest of all time reference. He says, do not forbid them for of such is the kingdom of God. Jesus himself is calling children the kingdom of God. And here we are saying, oh yeah, it's okay if they're not convenient to just push them aside. Oh yeah, it's okay if they do things that um, are uncomfortable for you to just ignore them or take advantage of them, manipulate them, whatever it is. Friends, let's let our hearts break for the things that break God's heart. 
He cares about one child. He cares about one child that doesn't feel safe. One child. How much more so, how much, how much power is in this room to care about children? In our own homes, our own communities, our own rock family. Psalm 127 verse 3 says, Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord. The fruit of the womb is a reward. Take that, Roe v. Wade. The fruit of the womb is a reward. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I read this week that the abortion, whatever, is under the Jezebel spirit. Okay, that's the principality over it. And Jezebel's an interesting character, and she's getting real scared right now. That whole principality is getting scared. So if you've seen more and more witchcraft start to surface in your life, that's because it's getting exposed everywhere. Okay, we have nothing to be afraid of. We just keep worshiping. We just keep saying that, God, you are the God of life. You are not the God of witchcraft. You are not the God of manipulation. You're a God of clarity. You're a a God who cares about every child. Okay, abortion is just a symptom. Witchcraft is the root. So Jesus is going after it because we've asked him to. We've asked him to expose the dark places, but he will pierce the darkness. That's who he is. So the children, and I believe that there is about to be a huge influx of children that need parents. How are we going to respond? Because you not only have been given an incredible stewardship by God as a parent to raise your children from birth, but only you can train them up in the way they should go. That's a responsibility. And the word responsibility means you are responsible for your abilities. That's what we as parents, or spiritual parents, everybody in this room gets to do. So your godly impact on their lives, the lives of children, may very well be the beginning of revival. What if revival right now is in your home because you are continuing steadfastly in prayer, in preaching the gospel, in loving your children the way that Christ loves the church? That is revival. It's happening right now. So what if our greatest strategy for revival isn't to spend money on large outreach events, but rather to spend quality time investing in our marriages and children? I'm not opposed to events. I love them. They're awesome. But not at the sake of foregoing our marriages and our home life. So when you walked in this morning, you were handed a name tag. I did not pick mine out. Somebody gave it to me. Mine says bold. Our, (laughs) yeah, shocker, I know. One of the things, if revival's going to start in our home, our kids have to know who they are. Amen? Because when you know who you are, you know how to behave. So my children who are here today, they have name tags on, but all day at home, I just look at my kids, I say, you're brilliant, you're creative, you're a problem solver, okay? When, when you call out who somebody is, they know how to respond in a situation where they're confused. I'm gonna share one quick story and then each one of these students wants to share how God has impacted their life very quickly. But here's how important it is that we speak life over each other. Because anybody can find the dirt. Let's be people who find the gold. Okay? Let's be people who find the gold in others. And we call out who God created them to be, even if they're not operating in it. So a couple years ago, uh, we were going through a tough time with one of our children. And so when they would fall asleep, my husband and I would go in and we would just pray over their body because their spirit was not asleep. And we would pray and we declare over this child who they are. And we declare that you're a lover of God's presence. We declare that you have, you hear from heaven and that you have strategies from heaven to solve problems here on this earth. That you are creative, that the room lights up when you come in because you carry hope, you carry authority. And we start declaring this over our children as they sleep. And then one night, a couple months later, we were going to bed and we looked at each other. We said, did you leave the TV on? No. Did you leave the radio on? No. And we go into our child's room and in his sleep, 
In his sleep, he's singing out, I am a lover of your presence. So do not give up on speaking life and truth over your children. They are listening. Their spirit is listening. And that is the goal that we can call forth. So I've invited a few of my friends to come up. They're nervous. So I know we're going to honor them. We're going to listen. And what we've been doing on our encounter nights on Sunday nights is that we've been asking Holy Spirit to search our hearts and to see if there's anything in our lives that we are believing that is not rooted in truth. And one of the ways we know that if what we're believing is not rooted in truth is if it doesn't produce peace. So if you are believing something in your life and you're not expecting something good to happen, that's hopelessness and that's rooted in a lie. So one of the things we want to do to empower these kiddos who do not have a junior Holy Spirit is we want to help, help them recognize areas in their life where they're carrying hopelessness. Because any area of, that does not have hope is under the influence of lies. And so once you can say, oh, I did not have uh, truth. I wasn't speaking in truth there, thinking in truth. You have the privilege to renounce the lie and declare truth. It's very simple. You're going to watch it happen. Zion. The lie that I am renouncing is that I am unworthy of love, respect, and change. The truth that I am declaring is I am enough. Woo! The lie I'm renouncing is I'm unimportant. And it's always my fault. The truth I am declaring is I am loved and cared for. Come on. <laughs> Girls, can you come stand down here? We could do this all day. This is amazing. These are your children. So the lie that we're announcing is that we have made no effect in this world and that we aren't needed. And the truth that we are declaring is, I, I have, have a purpose. purpose. The lie that I am announcing is, is I am worthless and only broken when I'm and loved only loved when I am broken. And the truth that I am declaring is, is that I'm seen and loved by God no matter what. Oh. Woo! The lie I'm renouncing is that I'm not worth it, specifically that I'm not worth saving. But the truth is that God took the time to save me. I am powerful and I am loved. renouncing is that I am not enough and I need to become someone I'm not to be accepted. The truth I am declaring is that I'm more than enough and appreciated, appreciated and welcome as I am. The lie that I'm renouncing is that my mistakes lead me to be a failure. But God told me the truth is that failure is not who I am, and that failure leads to growth in his eyes. Wow. What each one of these students just declared means there's a breakthrough in the room for you too. 
okay? Because what happened is they had something happen in their life. It took root as a lie. And then what the enemy does is he turns it, a circumstance, into a shame statement, an identity statement that says something's wrong with you. That's what the enemy does. He turns it into shame. But what Jesus is doing right now is he's serving a table that says, hey, come, eat of my cup. Goodness and mercy are following you. And there is no room for shame. There's just love. And so when you come to me, yes, have you failed? Have you made mistakes? Yes, that does not define who you are. I created you, I get to define who you are. Period. So each one of these students is up here right now with a testimony. They're up here because they are overcomers. They are victorious. And so as we wrap up today, this beautiful Mother's Day, I can't think of a better opportunity than right now to come let one of these students pray for you, to pray with them, to bless them, to invest in them. This is our future, people. That is something to get excited about. This is hope. So everybody, every eye closed, every head bow, we're gonna pray. Let's everybody stand up. And as I'm praying, if some one of the posters or this, what the students said resonated with you, I want you to come down and stand in front of them as a sign declaring that you are worthy to be saved. You are worthy of love. Whatever it is that you're declaring, come stand near that student, near that sign. We're standing in solidarity to say, students, you're not alone. We see you. We are proud of you. You are truth tellers. So Jesus, we thank you for your truth that sets us free. We thank you that no weapon formed against us will prosper. We thank you, Holy Spirit, that these children, young in age, but mighty in power, they know who they are. And I pray that today would be a stone of remembrance as something is deposited in them right now by you, Holy Spirit, that these students know who they are. They know that they are called and that they are equipped and that is irrevocable. And so we break off in the name of Jesus, any ounce of shame, any arrow that has come against them. And we declare that the plans and purposes that you have designed for these students are yes and amen. And so we pray right now for a team of encouragers to come around each one of these students, Lord, that at homes, they would be revivalists in their homes, revivalists on their campus, revivalists in their workforce, Lord, wherever you bring them, Lord, they carry the full authority of heaven. And your word says that they are the kingdom of heaven. You are obsessed with these kids. You are obsessed with us, Father. It's such a joy to be your child. Such a joy to be your child. And we thank you, Holy Spirit, for the gift of being called by you. We thank you for your presence. We thank you for the gift of being a mom, a spiritual mom. We thank you for all the parents in this congregation today, all the families. And we pray, Lord, that you would teach us how to continue steadfastly in our homes, in our families, in our marriages. And would we follow the children who follow you? In Jesus' name.